Okay, <coughs> now it seems to work again. Um, now I'm going to to talk about the fr uh, freight planning and uh, and the air transport. Start a bit with the, with freight, freight planning. I I would I had planned to take that as uh, as an introduction to or as a wind up of the of the rail and the intermodal uh, section, but uh, I'll I'll deal with it now. It doesn't matter too much the sequence here. For a bit on freight planning. Uh, <coughs> prediction and forecasting is often difficult in this uh, in this uh, market. I'll come back to to why. But uh, one <coughs> one lesson that can be learned from from these these uh, statements are that uh, the future may be different from what we have seen in the past for various reasons. There may be technological uh, developments that can shift transport flows between modes. There may be cost issues connected to economic development in different parts of the world, which may cause a shift in trade flows, if you remember back to the international trade lecture that I gave. That there are, uh, there are uh, elements in international economics, trade economics, and uh, economic development that may shift trade flows. And that's when you get shifts that needs to be taken into account when you do forecasts. You may, for, uh, for certain operations, you may be quite certain about the, the future development, but in other uh, other elements may be uncertain, highly uncertain. So there are some examples: the stock market and the information and technology uh, and uh, the information and telecommunication technology, uh, which uh, reached the top in 2000 and then it leveled off sharply, and the real estate market. There are certain economic phenomena <coughs> that that should be taken into consideration. So we can just actually state that it's difficult to predict the future accurately. And hence, the freight distribution systems should be able to be flexible. They should be able to cope with changes. And most of them are. I mean, you can rather easily change uh, the directions of or flows within air transport, within uh, sea transport, road transport, rail transport, whatever. But there are different aspects of flexibility connected to the cost structure. Because if you have set up costs in a system that is dependent upon that a certain link needs to be, be uh, served, then you are less flexible than if you can just change to another airport or you can change to another terminal or whatever. But if you go into, uh, into strategic partnerships, for instance, one should be aware of such issues. That if you are going to, to make asset-specific investments that reduce, may reduce flexibility in terms of shifting uh, flows, you should be careful, at least if the future is, uh, is uncertain. <coughs> so there are certain macroeconomics <coughs> that are at work here. Uh, shifting comparative advantages is what I told. I call them that's shifting trade flows. Uh, this is a part of that picture. If you get I inflated prices of uh, labor and uh, and real estate in certain countries, seen some tendencies in China with uh, which wage increases, that may affect those regions' comparative advantages and hence the trade flows. There are, as I mentioned on one previous uh, lecture, a slight trend against re-industrialization of certain regions in, uh, in Western Europe and in the United States, which will cause shift trade flows. The car industry has expanded eastwards in Europe, also 
taking uh, cost advantage, uh, taking advantage of lower labor costs, and that is also affecting trade flows. That perhaps, to a larger extent, we're going between uh, Western countries and Western countries, or between Asia and Western countries. So we may have cyclical drops in international trade if you get cost increases in low-cost countries, backsourcing of activities, so this may go in cycle. So if you get a lot of backsourcing, costs will probably start to increase again in the, let's say, Western markets, and then you may have uh, offshoring again to, to other countries, perhaps not the same countries as you backsourced from, but I think, for instance, that uh, certain African countries will be the next, they will, in the future, I think, and that is my speculations, become a, a kind of a growth engine, perhaps not as strong as, uh, as China and Korea, and formerly in Japan, but they will certainly be, be, be placed on the map as, as, uh, as newly industrialized countries low-cost producers. This continuance of trade flows means you may have certain uh, changes. The inflation goes together with this one, so I'm not going to comment more. But you see, there are s some underlying economic forces that affects the transportation business, that affects the tra trade flows, affects the volumes. And when you start to affect volumes, you are then also affecting prices transport activities. Freight companies are private entities. So they, <coughs> they are not only doing freight, so we cannot just use costs from door to door transport costs to address the, the, let's say, the behavior, or to, to analyze behavior in this, uh, in this industry. You need to take, let's say, the transport, logistics, supply chain into consideration. Costs, terminals, costs, uncertainty with respect to, to disruptions in terminals, uh, feeding transport costs, capacity problems, uh, all kinds of uh, costs and risks that affects the, the, the whole supply chain of transport from A to B. So if you just collect the cost numbers of, say, let's say, uh, 500 kilometer sea leg, 200 kilometer rail leg, and then the final, uh, the last mile of, uh, of uh, 10 miles, to the final destination, to and from the final destination, you ignore important cost aspects connected to terminal lead time, risk of disruptions, and so on and so forth. So it decides <coughs> the allocation in terms of routes, modes, and terminals. Uh, there are also a slight change, at least in some countries, from a conventional authority, public authority, trying to, to have some kind of control over, over the, the freight flows, to become more independent public entities that takes control in some part of this uh, intermodal transport chain, particularly perhaps connected to the infrastructure. You may have infrastructure companies running the infrastructure, and not a uh, public directorate doing the same. And once you, you sort of introduce company with uh, budgets and may ha may you may have some certain demands for profits and so on and so forth, they start to behave slightly different. I'm not going into that in, uh, in any detail, but that is what is meant by this statement. You are also changing the organization model for uh, for parts of the public sector, like, like infrastructure ownership, that have an impact on this. I just need to check now whether the sound is on, right? It seems to be okay working. 
Because uh, transport flow data are confidential. They are often keep kept confidential. They are, I mean, they are uh, sensitive with respect to competition, and hence they are kept confidential. So it's, it's not easy to trace the true flows of cargo because of this. And that may cause some issues with respect to uh, planning. Because the, the public authorities, they need to plan, uh, let's say, infrastructure capacity. They may even plan the location of terminals and so on, expansion of terminals and so on and so forth. But it's not easy to plan if you don't have data. And the, and the consolidators, for instance, transport companies, are very careful with sharing data. And that may be an issue. So this is a, a general planning process, which is uh, used for instance, for planning uh, new road infrastructure projects, new rail infrastructure projects. You could also use it for planning of, let's say, long run or long term plans for, uh, for uh, issues related to, let's say, a long run uh, capacity dimensioning problem for a, for a transport company. Especially if you are engaged in uh, running terminals if you're engaged in running trains, and so on. Then you are talking about investments that you undertake in a long run perspective. So you, here, you are kind of talking about a market. How big is the market? Is the market uh, far away from the critical mass point for, a, for an intermodal, op intermodal operations? So needs and deficiencies are market needs and perhaps some risks connected to future development in the market, changing trade flows and so on. You need to, to, to ensure that you have the organization and staff resources available to, to, to serve this market. And you may also, on the other hand, have goals and objectives for what kind of activities you as a company, as a player here, want to develop in the future. So this is the goals and objectives for, for a company or for a society or whatever. So given <coughs> the needs of the market, your, uh, your resources and your objectives, you devel develop and evaluate alternatives. Uh, that may be choosing uh, how to build a new road from A to B. It may be where to locate a new terminal. It may be whether you should, uh, you should go into the rail transport market as a, an active player, or whether you should purchase rail transport services. So whether you should, should tie up capital in becoming an active player, perhaps investing in asset-specific investments, or whether you should take a step back and just purchase the services if you need them. To, and that may have to do with what you get as a result here, whether you, you want to have that, whether you need the flexibility, or whether you can go into a more long-term asset-specific relationship. If you choose a very flexible solution, you, in, in many cases, you choose a more expensive solution. So what you actually do when you, when you choose a flexible solution is that you pay a kind of risk premium, an insurance against market changes that can affect your, uh, your business uh, adversely. So you, 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 you buy an option to be more flexible in the future. And that may be a very, that may be a very good option, or it may be a very expensive option that you will not use. So we need to be uh, careful when you analyze that. But that is a part of developing and evaluating alternatives. So there is a kind of a what if analysis. What do I get if I do this? What do I get if I do that? What kind of cost do I, do I, uh, do I get if I do this or that? And you 
compare alternatives against a base case, which may be the current situation, or the current situation including some necessary upgrading. You use this uh, analysis for preparing and, uh, and adopting a long-range plan using uh, formal techniques or more informal techniques for uh, analyzing your, your data, cost data, market data, uncertainty, risk data, and so on. You may perhaps need to coordinate your plans with others. I mean, if you are in the position of a terminal and you want to develop the terminal, you need, of course, to also have communication with, let's say, the road authorities, railway authorities, some of the big transport companies, some of the big customers, and so on. When you have this plan, you have chosen, let's say, concepts for the future. Then you are going to, to do project programming to, to, let's say, deciding upon what projects and what sequence of projects you should undertake to achieve your goals and objectives. Do you need to relocate? Do you need to buy something new, to, to build something new? Uh, do you need to upgrade certain part of the, of, the, of the system and so on and so forth? And then <coughs> you develop and implement the projects, the specific projects, and then we are on the level where we decide upon uh, how to build a new rail link. Uh, we have decided to build a new rail link. Now we need to to tender for uh, for someone to or to announce a tender that someone is going to build it and how much it should cost, using the market to get to get people to sort of do the construction work for you and so on and so forth. Public private input. Private input here may, may mean that you hire someone to build something. Financial planning and funding is important because uh, many of the projects are very expensive and you need to, to, uh, to be careful. Use uh, some kind of uh, convenient funding re regime. If you are doing global transport, you need to fund projects. Perhaps uh, you need to take currency rates and everything into consideration to hedge against risks when you are doing, let's say, international projects like, uh, like you are often engaged in when you are doing uh, international transport. So this is just a framework for, uh, for long-term planning when you, are, uh, when you are engaging into, let's say, investments in a part of the network. Just put it up, this up. We are, <coughs> at this college, we are doing quite a lot of, of passenger transport planning, which can be handled uh, perhaps more easily because we have plenty of data available. We know the size of the transport flows. We know exactly how many cars that are using the road network to and from this school because the traffic is counted regularly. We have a lot of survey data available to, to, to determine a car that passes a certain uh, part of the road network. Uh, we can say with a quite a substantial amount of probability, where does a given car come from? Where does it go to? So we can say quite a lot about the distribution of traffic in the, in the network for passenger traffic or, uh, or uh, individuals that are going from A to B, whether they choose a car or public transport or whatever. So trip generation, number of trips generated from a specific part of town and where they go to is quite well understood and predicted. We have numerical models that do that quite, uh, quite, uh, quite good, I think. The transport authorities the Department or the Ministry of Transport and Communication in a the country, they have a responsibility for 
this kind of passenger plan. Stakeholders, which are you and me as, as uh, users of the transport network, uh, there may be uh, people living close to heavily trafficked roads that gets environmental costs from passenger transport, they are also quite easy to identify them. There are systems that can handle this. But then it comes to freight planning. You don't have any single jurisdiction. You have a lot of transport companies. You have uh, perhaps uh, a shared public responsibility between publicly owned infrastructure companies. You may have the Ministry of Trade and Foreign Affairs that takes care of global transport issues. You may have the Ministry of Transport and Communications taking care of the domestic transport issues. You may have counties that are taking care of county cargo transport, freight transport, and so on. So there are lots of different jurisdictional uh, aspects involved in freight transport planning. Sensitive to market forces, <coughs> talked about uh, trade flows and so on, costs, difficult to forecast demand. Well, it is possible, and lots of efforts are done, but the quality of the demands are perhaps even more connected to this point. Scarcity of, uh, of available data, rather than the difficult market forces. Because we know a lot, quite a lot, about the long-run market forces that are at work. We talk about, if you talk about, for instance, global economic development issues. The main problem is availability of data. I have tried to dig out the true amount of cargo that goes from this county and to the county, county up north, Trondelag, or even to Oslo. And it's not easy to get the true amounts. You get some approximations, but you don't get the true amounts. Freight holders, stakeholders are uh, behaving, let's say, atomistically. They don't want to share information. Uh, they don't often want to engage in common efforts to, say, transfer goods from road to rail and sea because they are afraid of revealing information about costs and volumes and things like that. So they are difficult to engage. That has to do with this point. So whereas we can plan passenger transport, not easily, but we have a lot of data and models and things like that, it's, it's more difficult for freight planning. It's more privatized, if you like. So these are some stakeholders. You see them here. I, I don't need to say too much about it, I think. Uh, <coughs> the, the, the companies in the private sector, lots of them. Uh, and they are kind of reluctant to share often reluctant to share information. It has improved, though. There are some efforts that have been made to try to coordinate. But the private stakeholders, they need to be made aware of kind of their benefits from coordination. If you don't manage to, to sell that coordination is good for you and for the whole, let's say, business, you don't succeed. So before involving private stakeholders like transport companies into some kind of project that, shall, that is, for instance, going to transfer cargo from one mode to another, you need often to do quite a lot of analytical work upfront to be able to, let's say, sell the case to them as profitable or feasible for also the the different private sector stakeholders. Yeah, this is just again uh, a slight, small uh, introduction to 
change in logistic systems. We are now in a situation where the service-based economy is growing strongly in some parts of the world, whereas manufacturing-based activities are growing in other parts of the world. So manufacturing is, is a very grow, uh, strongly growing activity in, uh, in parts of Asia, parts of Af Africa, and even parts of Europe and the United States, with reference to what I've said, said earlier. Uh, but they are different in nature. Because here we have, may have regularly scheduled flows of bulk products to serve the factories with, uh, with supplies of steel and uh, wood and so on. Uh, if we take this, this uh, upstream supplier thing with the supply of raw materials, you have a focus on maintaining inventory levels. It may be fuel to, to, to fuel uh, power plants, aircraft, and so on. Um, more long haul movements because there are, uh, let's say, if you, if you build up a manufacturing industry in parts of the world where there are a scarcity of raw materials, you need long transports. You have seen that earlier <coughs> in, the, in the strong growth in Japan during the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. They have very little uh, raw materials themselves and then you become quite, quite dependent upon sea transport. Whereas when you have the industrialization of Europe, the dependence was much stronger on, the air, on rail transport. So more deep sea transports, more resistant to transport system delays. That has to do with more focus on just-in-time production, that you need the supplies when, uh, in when, when they, are, they fit with the scheduling on production. Uh, less uh, or, or focus on, on reducing inventory costs and so on. So that is the, let's say, the basic changes in the manufacturing-based economy. More focus on just-in-time, uh, more focus on reducing lead time variance, scheduling, and so on. Service-based economy, then we are on this just-in-time delivery. It, of course, affects the manufacturing-based economy as well, because when we talk about service industry, we, we talk about car rentals, travel agencies, and so on, but also airlines and hospitals, which is also part of the service industry, but they are heavily dependent upon manufactured goods to be able to perform or deliver their services. So there are interrelated, uh, let's say, when you are in increasing needs of just-in-time deliveries, that will, of course, affect the manufacturing economy as well. Information. <coughs> the information flow. Fourth-party logistics providers that are basically dealing with information flow, making the suppliers performing their operations at the right place, right time, right quantity, and so on, including the transport companies. More frequent, shorter movements goes together with this. But also, smarter consolidation of cargo to reduce the need for transport movements by optimizing flows, to consolidate flows, to avoid, let's say, unnecessary uh, movements with, uh, with smaller or with uh, not too good capacity utilization of the vehicles, to, to consolidate even in a just within a just-in-time system, to reduce the problem with the, with the little capacity utilization on the vehicles is, Im is important. And then the costs and the correct prices is an important, uh, also an important aspect of uh, optimizing a system with just-in-time to ensure 
in uh, sufficient capacity, capacity utilization of the vehicles. The increased focus on reliability is also an important feature of, of uh, or an important pattern we see within the service-based economy. Uh, goes together with the just-in-time uh, immediate need for, for, for deliverances and so on. So this is basically what I had in mind to say about freight planning. There are lots, lots to say about it. There are models and so on and so forth. But this is just a small introduction and those of you who want to work more with this could perhaps uh, do a master's in logistics, for instance, where you will have more of this scheduling and planning issues connected to freight. So thank you. We will uh, have a small break and then continue with air transport.